Uh, take your Bibles, and, and I, I don't know what's going to happen tonight, I never really do, but uh, to Acts chapter 2, uh, just, I may just talk to you for a little while. I, I guess the, the, the Lord is burdened, burdening, burdening my heart. I mentioned it this morning. Uh, I, I talked uh, last, not on Tuesday, on our Thanksgiving meal uh, uh, service, but uh, the Wednesday before, uh, I went in and, and brought up from the archives a, a lesson that I had brought years ago and uh, had to do uh, with, uh, with uh, body, soul, and spirit, the three parts of us. And we, we had some fellows up here illustrating, uh, and, uh, and we talked about, we got to, to see one of our uh, little young men die on stage. It was awesome. And a uh, yeah, very good uh, death scene. Uh, it was, and, uh, and, but we, we tried to, to put body, soul, and spirit in order uh, and, uh, and make, try to make some sense out of this, this concept uh, that we all struggle with, the Christian life. Uh, and, and that's what we struggle with. When we get saved, it, it begins, we think, too often uh, we have this misnomer, mis, uh, misdiagnosed, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, we have this picture of how Christianity is. And for some reason, we, our, our picture is, I know what it is, but I, we have this picture of, I've, got, I've gotten saved, so everything is going to fall into place in my world. Everything is going to uh, work out. Uh, God's going to take care of me. I don't have to worry about anything anymore. Uh, life is fixing to be good. We don't realize that we have just, and this is, I might get in trouble, Lord, please forgive me if I say it wrong. It's, it's kind of like we don't realize that we've, uh, we drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, and, and I'm not saying anything disrespectful uh, about that. It's a conceptual thing. We have accepted Christ as Savior, but we don't understand the gravity of what's transpired internally. We don't understand it. Uh, I, I, I describe it a number of times. I've won somebody to the Lord on their doorstep. And then I try to explain to them, the, of course, eternal security, trying to invite them to church. Then I try to explain to them, let me tell you, something's going on inside of you. You're not going to understand. I hope you'll remember this discussion. We may never see each other again. But the reality is that what happened, all of us have innately, we have a conscience. We have this idea. Generally, it's a, uh, given to us and, and encouraged through our parental treatment or the, the teaching and training that our parents have given us. And we have this idea of right and wrong in our heads, whether uh, that even though we're unsaved, we get this idea of what's right and wrong. And that's why a kid, prior to getting saved, if he steals something, he looks over his shoulder for, for somebody to applaud or mom somebody. He has a sense of guilt, if you will, that goes on. What happens when one gets saved? It took me a while to grasp this concept, but when one gets saved, now all of a sudden, those little impulses or the guilt that I felt when I did wrong now seems to be amplified at a greater level uh, because this is why, because we've gotten the Holy Spirit put in our hearts and I, I, I try to explain it like this, it's like plugging in uh, our conscience to an amplifier now it, 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 it permeates every part of us, every part of our being when I do wrong, now I don't necessarily look over my shoulder to to, uh, to see who's going to bother me. Now it just is this feeling inside of me like I, and I mentioned it this morning about when we get right with God, how clean we feel. But when we're doing wrong, we feel dirty. And we really can't, it's hard to put into words unless you've lived it, uh, how a Christian and, and how now sin affects us internally. Uh, I firmly believe, I've said this before, I firmly believe that some of the most miserable people on this earth are Christians who have uh, uh, chosen to ignore God, ignore God's commandments, and just live the life they want to live. And it's an it, because they're, they're beat up, they're so miserable because they're beat up internally and externally. There are consequences to our sin. If we choose to do wrong, there are natural consequences to our sin. But if we choose to do wrong, we have to deal with the natural consequences of our sin. But also, those of us that are saved now have internally uh, 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 this guilt that, that permeates our very being, our very soul. And it's hard to live with. And it creates a, a crankiness. Uh, illustration, we've had three kids in our house. We've tried to raise them. 
uh, my wife and I, if we're ever talking to you or talking to them, we have always known, we always know what's going on with the kids, but we always know when they're not right. You just sense that there's something in their behavior, their demeanor, how they carry themselves, that we can just tell. And and what we do, uh, uh, Laura, if you are usually, she's keen on this, of course, linked in with the kids closer probably than I, and uh, and she links in and she'll say, uh, something's wrong with them. And, uh, and of course, and I want to go get the paddle and whack them, because that's what dads do. And uh, uh, mom says, something's wrong with you, it's time to clobber them. And uh, <laughs> that just kidding, Facebook world, please don't hold this against me. I'm going to get a black mark. But uh, we want to mend our, we just go, I'm going to go fix it. Generally, my wife says, no, leave them alone. We just need to pray for them. Uh, I, and man, I don't really, I just want to fix it. And, uh, uh, but, but honestly, the best approach is praying for them. And it's, it's been neat to see through the years with our children to see how God has worked to uncover some of those things. And it was, a lot of times we don't ever really know the details, but uh, we've gone to camp and our kids come to us and say, I'm so sorry. I don't know what they're sorry for, but they're telling me, I love you and I'm so sorry, I disappointed you. I really wasn't disappointed. But uh, that brokenness internally to them was good, and they don't know that mom and I have been praying for them for a few uh, weeks now, maybe a few months, trying to pray that God will use you and God will clean up the message that we know something there, we just can't put our fingers on it. And the reality is the reason we struggle with things like that, we have this internal struggle, is because we have been given this Holy Spirit. And I want to show you a little bit tonight of some of the things this Holy Spirit, who, does, who is the Holy Spirit for and, and why? Why is he here? What's his purpose? What's his job? Uh, and, and, and so uh, Acts chapter 2, we're going to talk just a little bit about uh, who is filled, and we're going to talk about then when Pentecost happened, and uh, and so bear with me to try to put this together. I have some scattered thoughts in my mind and heart that I want to try to convey. Uh, hopefully, it makes sense by the end. <laughs> Not a guarantee, uh, but uh, but you you can put it together later. Uh, Brother Sam can do some amazing things with the video, and he might have to chop and and uh, and put things together in a different way. We'll see how it works out. First four, four verses of chapter uh, two there in Acts. The Bible says, "When the day of Pentecost was fully come." They were all uh, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of, uh, uh, as of a mighty, a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them the cloven tongues, uh, as, uh, like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We know the rest of the chapter as it goes Peter breaks, uh, blows up, if you will, into a, a, a big sermon. He starts to preach. I believe the, the tongues spoken of here, I believe are languages, uh, very clear. At Pentecost, many different uh, people in the Jewish community, they were under bondage. They were uh, all over the place, but they'd always migrate back home during Pentecost and and the Passover, and this was a time when they would have all been there. They don't all speak the language any longer, but they're of the Hebrew genetics and their Hebrew lineage, and they'd all come back home and celebrate these two big uh, times in their uh, existence and certainly in their history. And so they gather here at, at Pentecost, and uh, they're, they've come to, uh, to be part of the festivities, much like our Thanksgiving and Christmas New Year's, everyone gathers for a big party. That's kind of what's going on here. So you have people from all different areas, and, and uh, since Israel was all divided up, they were coming from all and spoke different languages. And, uh, and so Peter, I believe, goes out there and he preaches this message, but I believe he preaches in the language he knew. I believe the miracle of it wasn't necessarily that Peter, Peter spoke different languages. I believe that God gave understanding to those that were in the crowd, whoever, whatever language they spoke. Uh, Peter speak, uh, speaking his language, uh, the people around him heard the message, the gospel message, uh, in their own tongue, and they were flabbergasted by this. How can one man speak multiple languages? Uh, I don't think he was speaking but one language. God was giving understanding. How that happened? God's Holy Spirit. That's how it happened. And God's Holy Spirit gave understanding. Uh, I can't explain how, the nuts and bolts of how, but I can tell you that's how God works. And, uh, and so I believe that's what happened. And so God is giving 
this power, and everyone's in awe of the fact that all this is transpiring here. But I want you to notice this in verse number four, what it says here. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to notice that one word in there. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, I think we have this misconception that the only people that can be filled with the Holy Ghost are certain selected folk. I mean, Bible scholars filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they should be. I mean, preachers, yeah, they should be. Sunday school teachers, sure. A deacon, every once in a while, you trip over a deacon that's filled with the Holy Spirit, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I had to say it that way because Miss Miss Bonnie, Brother Steve, was going to go home and say, see, I told you I got it. And she was going to say, no, you don't. And uh, uh, so I'm just trying to eliminate that and give her out. Brother Dustin said there's only a couple of them and you want one of them. But uh, the, the reality is that those are people in leadership in the church, but they're not all that he's talking about. He's talking about all. So I wanted to go back with this mindset, this concept of the Holy Spirit power and what it does and how one can use it in their everyday life. You see, I, I'm convinced that we, when we talk about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, everyone gets a spooky look on their face. Like, ooh. And we think, oh, it's like going to be a, a, a movie, a, a horror movie, and there's ghosts and goblins and, and, and floaty things and stuff. But I don't think the Holy Spirit is that spooky. When we really understand his purpose and we understand what he does for us, I think it takes a lot of the spooky way and brings some practicality to it. I want to show you who this all, notice that word all, everyone in the room were filled. <coughs> Look over at Acts chapter 1, just a page back in your Bibles, Acts chapter 1. Look at verse number 13, the Bible says, And when they were come in, they went up into the, an upper room. There abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and, and uh, Simon, uh, Zelotes, and uh, uh, Judas. It's funny, I'm struggling on the easy ones. Judas, the brother of James. And all these continued with one accord in prayer uh, and supplication with the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number, look at this parenthetical statement here, the number and of names together were about 120. He gives us a list of people here that are in this upper room. We get a bunch of the disciples. We get those men who had been with Jesus. But it's interesting in there, verse 14 says, with the women. Wait a minute, women aren't supposed to get this sort of thing. I mean, it's only a manly thing. That's all I've ever heard in church. Women keep silence in the church. Man, it would be good if they did, but they really don't. Uh, but, yeah, sometimes we say things we wish we wouldn't, Michael. Well, that happens up here when I get a microphone in front of our face. It'll be all right. But uh, part of us we say, hey, I don't want the women to say anything. Just keep quiet. Don't say nothing. And women all over the place are saying amen. No, they're not. And men are too scared to say amen because they're sitting by a wife that'll kill them. And, uh, but uh, that's our mindset. And we think, well, I've always been told women just be quiet, don't do nothing. They're just supposed to stay at home and, and cook cookies and have babies. And that's their job. That's all they're supposed to do. I'm kind of getting a lot of trouble right now. I'm in a lot of trouble. And, uh, uh, but that's everyone's perception of women. No, it's not. God said here all, everybody in this room, women included. The truth is this 120 folk, God has the Holy Spirit. He's given to all of them. All of them had the same power that Peter had. Think of that for a minute. When you think about women, aren't that important? Seriously? God gave them the Holy Spirit here. The, the problem is that we have a mis miscommunication. Actually, people really don't know their Bible. Uh, pre trying to preach the Bible and preach messages they don't know nothing about. And so they create this imagery, if you will, of, oh, well, women don't know nothing about the Bible. That's foolish. Some of the most knowledgeable people about the Bible is our women. And I'm telling you, women have some insight about the Bible. They really do. They can give you insight. And honestly, we men tend to be so dogmatic. Sometimes we need a little bit of the women's side to uh, women's flair uh, to, uh, to bring a little emotion to us. Some of us men could use a little bit of that. Uh, some of us are just boring blonde. We need a little pizzazz. Get that pizzazz from your wife and go for it. Brother Steve just looked at his wife. That pizzazz. That's what we call it, Brother Steve. Bonnie's not pizzazz. So when she's fussing at you in the hands like this, pizzazz. That's what we call it. And 
And so, so just take it, man. You're so, you need it. And uh, the reality is that we have this misconception uh, about who is supposed to get this Holy Spirit. So I thought, well, I'll tell you who the prophetically, or the Bible tells us, is supposed to get this Holy Spirit. So if you look in your Bibles to Joel. That's going to be hard to find. Uh, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, no. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and this Joel. Uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. After Hosea, there it is. Uh, after Hosea is Joel. Uh, so find Hosea. Good luck. And uh, uh, he looks in the front part of your Bible. Uh, okay, go to Ezekiel. Keep going back. Daniel. Then Hosea. And after Hosea is Joel. Keep on going. And uh, you'll see that. I want you to see this. And, and, and we'll probably end here. I, I don't think we'll go much further. But I want to show you who this Holy Spirit originally is for. Who God predicted in the in the minor prophets, and He said to him, through His prophets, who He wants to have access to this Holy Spirit power. It's not just for the pastors, like too often we think. It's not just for church leaders. It's not just for evangelists. Uh, God has a plan and a purpose, and this Holy Spirit is supposed to be someone we engage. Now, let me explain to you how the Holy Spirit comes to being and how we're supposed to utilize Him. Uh, how many in here, you know how to drive a stick shift or a manual transmission? How many of you can say that you know this? Okay, what do we know? Miss Terry, don't raise your hand. Uh, how did we know? Uh, she raised her hand and she did this waving at me. It wasn't that, but that's what that means. She had a nice car that was a five speed. She sat out here and grinding, and grinding, and grinding. And said, keep trying, keep trying. She did for a while. Next time I saw her, she had a different car. I don't know what she did with that car, but she found what's automatic. And uh, uh, I'm just picking on her, it's okay. Uh, but uh, she does kind of know how, you know, she knows concept, right? You know the concept. So in an, uh, an automatic, an automatic, you take the, 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 uh, the, uh, the gear shift and you pull it down or move it off here. Uh, and you pull it off of the P uh, and you pull it into a gear, you put it in drive and that's it. And it goes, right? Put in the D and it goes, not a five speed. A five speed, you have to, or a six shift, you have to put it in gear. Now, how many of you that have ever, that, that have driven a, a, a manual transmission have gotten it almost in gear but not quite? Have you all been through that? Well, what happens when you pull off that clutch and you're only almost in gear, uh, that thing goes pop, and then you go nowhere. And you freak out. I mean, the first time that happens, it's like, <laughs> Just usually by the time that happens, you were already, you've already stalled it a few times. You know what happens when it stalls, but this thing's still running. And that big pop you're not used to, and it's, it freaks you out. The reality is that what, it, what happened is you did not get that gear shift all the way in the right slot, all the way engaged. Otherwise, you can't go. If you want to go in first gear, you've got to get it all the way first. Uh, have you ever gone to third gear when you're cruising down the road pretty good, lickety split speed? You get it in third gear, but only get partly in there, and uh, and then you let go of it, and it goes like that as your uh, as, as it pops itself back out of gear. And you're like, hey, what do I do? What do I do? And uh, uh, there's it, a little fear going. On. How do I know this happens more than all the time in the car? And yes, I know this stuff happens. No, I did it. I, 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 anybody, if those people that have never popped the clutch and saw the car are those people that never drove a standard transmission vehicle. Everyone that's ever driven one has, has been through it. You'll go through it. And every one of us has been trapped in the middle of an intersection, remember? And uh, saw the car, and you're freaking out because, hey, 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 trying to get it started, get down the road, freaking out, popping the clutch, stalling again. We've all done it. Been there, done that. Worst thing possible is when they put a stop sign at the top of the hill. Why? Why would we do that? That's like the worst possible thing. And then the idiot that's behind you pulls right up underneath your bumper. <laughs> And then, and then they start honking at you because you ain't going. Well, I ain't going, fool, because as soon as I put my foot pull off that clutch, I'm going to rear-end you. You're going to rear-end me. I don't know how many requirements we're fixing the meat. I don't want to. Uh, it's a difficult concept. Uh, but uh, this gear, and honestly, that's, I think, my best brain, how my brain can fathom this idea of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is inside of me. It's like a gear shift. I got it. I got it. The Holy Spirit's in there. The problem is if I don't engage him, he don't do nothing. He don't do nothing. He just sits there. 
And the truth is, the only thing that truly engages the Holy Spirit is when I say, okay, Holy Spirit, I want you to help me with this. I got to actively put him in gear. And, and the problem that we have in Christianity is we get him with salvation. We just don't engage him. We don't put him to work. We just do what we do. And that's why, like this morning, I try to encourage us, get your Bible and read the Bible and let God direct you. Because that's reading the Bible. Who wrote the Bible? Does anyone remember? Who wrote the Holy Spirit? God. God the Father. Uh, put the, 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 the format together. Uh, God, the Son, uh, he spoke the word, right? The word, right? But the Bible teaches us that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it was a triune being that put the Bible together, and the Holy Spirit put the Bible together and knows what it says, right? And if he knows what it says, it stands to reason if I engage him in my life, and say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm reading your word. Teach me something from it. He will. Problem is, we don't engage him. But oftentimes, we read the Bible and say, I don't understand it. You know why you don't understand it? You never engage the Holy Spirit. How do I engage the Holy Spirit? Tell him, hey, I need you to help me understand this. Help me. And the truth is that many times as Christians in our world today, we don't understand that concept. We never access that Holy Spirit side of us. <coughs> So we're just blindly walking through life, and the truth is that he wants to guide us. He just has to be put, we have to put the gear shift over there. And, 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 and so it's available, look what it says, I'm getting way ahead of myself, Joel chapter 2, did we ever find that? Verse number 28, look what it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Listen to this. Sons and daughters. Listen to what it says. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. And those uh, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Who's he talking about? The young people. Teenagers. Listen, teenagers. God wants to put his Holy Spirit on you. And use you. You don't have to be an old buddy daddy like me for God to use you. Let the Holy Spirit use you as a young person. And just may I say, you have a whole lot more drive, vigor, and vitality than I got. I have to drag my carcass up out there. I, went in, I did some work this afternoon. I went and sat down in the recliner. Ate me a piece of pumpkin pie buried in, uh, in, in whipping cream. It's going to last forever on me. It's going to be around the middle, and my mouth's going to hold it up for a whole year. I'm sure it's going to linger. But I don't care. I was going to sit there and rest. I got there. I rested. I didn't take a nap. I didn't even doze. But I sat there in the recliner. Time came for us to go to church. Do you know how hard it was to get my carpets out of that stupid chair? Everything in, in, in me, uh, that chair had, uh, had, had absorbed me. And, uh, and Laura got up and she went to pick up her parents. And I said, I can go through. And she said, okay. And she got up, she kissed me, and she <coughs> left. And I was still in the chair. And I sat there a little bit longer and I thought, I got to get up. Come on. I hadn't even slept. I was just there. You kids, you can bounce and fall down and get up. Fall down and get up. And you have drive and excitement, and, 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 and you can stay up till 2 or 3 in the, at, at night, get up the next day, run around, and do all kinds of crazy things. If I stay up 2 or 3 in the morning, I'm done. There's about three days that I'm, I'm, I, might, I might be up and moving, not really there, not engaged. Uh, I, I, I might have killed her a little bit. That's what happened. But let me carry on. It says, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also, verse 29, also upon the servants and upon the handmaid, in those days will I pour out my spirit. You're talking about the old Bible times where servants, that would be the lower class people. He's talking about, I'm pouring my spirit out to everybody. And verse 39, I will show wonders in heaven and in earth and blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into the darkness, the moon into the blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. And shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, I want us to understand this passage splits it all up. And explains to us that his Holy Spirit is for everybody. When we get saved, God wants us to start using that Holy Spirit gear. 
He went to spot that girl, uh, uh, what's your name, Joe's car, uh, yesterday. Joe's car is a five-speed. He told me it was a five-speed. The little uh, uh, Hyundai, what is it, Accent? Hyundai Accent. And, uh, and I needed to run up here to the church, uh, to the, church the other night, and, and uh, I said, well, can I borrow your car? Was it the last one in the driveway? I said, can I borrow your car real quick? Yep. It's, he said, it's a stick. You know how to drive. Oh, you know how to drive that. That's what he said. I got into that car, and I went in there. And I sat down at five feet. I put my hand on the gear shift knob. It was dark at four o'clock in the afternoon, but it was dark later than that. I put my hand on the gear shift knob, put, pushed the clutch in, uh, started it up, and it ran. And then I put the, the gear all the way over here and pushed back. It was supposed to be reverse. It wasn't. Wasn't there. I tried it again. Wasn't there. His car was manufactured in Canada. <laughs> so I uh, four or five times tried it there. And then I tried it up here. I know it was probably, what, third gear? would have been third gear, maybe fifth gear. I don't know. And it went forward. But that's not the way I want to go. I'm going to go backwards, getting closer and closer to the car in front of me. I brought it all the way over. And sometimes reverse is up here. So I tried that. Uh, and it pulled me forward more. I'm getting real close to the car in front of me. It wouldn't have mattered. It was Debbie's. I don't care. But, uh, <laughs> and not mine. I don't care. And Joe, I'm driving Joe's car, so it's like a win-win for me. And I get closer and closer uh, between the cars. And, and as I got there, I thought, you know what? I'm going to figure it out. I turned my stupid phone. I turned the light on my phone. And I looked over the gear shift knob. And you know where reverse is? Way over yonder and up. Crazy Canadians put it in the wrong gear. <laughs> they put reverse way over here, and that's supposed to be way over here on a five speed. Now, a six speed, that's where it is. If you just told me it's a six speed, I'd have put it over there, but it wasn't a six speed. Uh, but and you have this little gadget, and you have to pull up. You have to pull a little gadget, move it over, and I was, I, was, I, was going, I was going nuts trying to figure out how to get this stupid car to reverse. I didn't want to go and admit to him I can't find it. You know, that's embarrassing. So I had to figure it out myself, which I did, praise the Lord. But uh, the, the, the reality is I didn't know where reverse was. The car was never going to go backwards unless I found the R or put it in neutral and pushed. It wasn't going to go backwards. <laughs> and I wasn't going to push it. I promise you that. Uh, so uh, I had to find reverse. The problem with Christianity today is oftentimes uh, I believe what, what's happening in Christianity is no one's telling our people that we need to put gear in the Holy Spirit mode. We walk through this life aimlessly and we think, I'm okay and I'm going to be okay. My goal tonight is just to show you that God gave this Holy Spirit to everybody. He prophetically said, I want this to be for everybody. In the, uh, the upper room, when these 120 people were up there praying, it was 120 uh, people. It doesn't say what people. It just said a group of people, including women, including men in the list. And what he's telling us is this Holy Spirit is available for everybody, but we Christians won't get it if we don't put the gear in. What I want to try and encourage you tonight, and only the, all the further we're going to get, is I want us to start finding that Holy Spirit gear. So I'm going to challenge you to try this experiment. Some of you are sitting there thinking, Brother Dusty, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Holy Spirit gear. Good heaven. Do you think inside of us we got this gear shift now? Oh, yeah. yeah, you probably do. I don't know. It's just the way my brain thinks. But in your brain, when you go to do something, access the Holy Spirit gear. How do I shift gears? Just take a second of time out and say, okay, Holy Spirit, if you're really there, I need your help making this decision. Very simple way to start. When it comes to Bible reading time, say, Holy Spirit, I need something from your word. Help me find it. And start reading your Bible. I challenge each one of us to just take some time and just try it then. And maybe if we see, wow, I got something on my Bible reading and I've gone, I've read Bible over and over again and I've got anything out of it and now I'm getting something out of it that's the Holy Spirit working inside of you, and before long you'll find out you can use, do you know what you can use? The whole, he wants to be a part of your life. He wants a relationship, and he wants to make, he wants to work with you to help you through your life. He's referred to the Bible for me as a paraclete, one who runs alongside, one who's there to help and, and, and 
uh, help you through. Jesus referred to him as the comforter. He's there with you all the time. The problem is we don't engage him. It's if you don't put the gear in the Holy Spirit gear, nothing happens. And I want to challenge all of us to start using the Holy Spirit gear. It's there. If you've accepted Christ as Savior, you've got one. But I don't know where it is, Brother Dusty. You might in the dark have to get your flashlight on to turn it on. I'm telling you how to turn it on. Before you start something, say, God, I, I need your help. The Holy Spirit's supposed to be in me. The Holy Spirit, if you're there, and he is. The Holy Spirit, I need you to help me through this one. Can I just tell you, that's the only way I made it through college. I made it through college, and <clears throat> I graduated, get this, with honors. Nobody laughs. I thought everyone would laugh there. Because that's a great place to laugh, because most of you know how intelligent I'm not. And yet, I graduated from Bible college with four-year degree and honors. Can I tell you, I studied less than anybody else at that college, I'm pretty sure. Because I didn't have time. I had a wife and, uh, and a house to keep up. And then all of a sudden, she decided to have babies. So we had Sam. And then she decided to have Jeannie. I'm still in college. I can't even pay the bills to keep us alive. Now I got Sam and Jeannie to keep alive. I was working jobs and giving myself, averaging about three or four hours of sleep. Study was way down the list. Do you know what my study style consisted of when I'd walk into a class? And as I walk into the class, one of the kids say, uh, did you study for your test to one of the other kids? They didn't talk to me because I just barely whizzed in and whizzed out. That was it. And as I come into the room, <laughs> I slide into the room and I hear, test? What's the test over? And they'd say, oh, it's, it's over what he's talking about. Well, that's, this was study time for me. During, during prayer request time, I'm glad I went to a Bible college. During prayer request time, I studied. Well, Brother Dusty, weren't you concerned about the prayer, the prayer list? Sure I was, and I knew he was going to pray for him, so I studied. He said, well, that's cold-hearted. I had to make it somehow. That was my study time. Memorizing verses would be from class to class, I would memorize verses. I'm not very smart. But over and over again, you know what I'd say? Oh, Holy Spirit, please. Please, please. I'm tired. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to help you. You've got to help me get through this test. I have looked at tests, and I don't know what they were saying. They have a blank, and I filled the blanks in. My favorite tests were the essay tests. We're going to have an essay test. Yes. You know why? I'm wordy. Is that, you know what that means? Wordy. That means if you know, if they give you the, if they... If they ask you a question, in the question you have the answer. That's the way I would look at it. So I take whatever that question is and rewrite the question in a statement, and then I ad lib. And what if what I found out if you ad lib in an essay test to where your hand hurts, that teacher is not going to read the whole essay question. They're not going. It does not matter. They're going to look at it and say. Dude, this guy knows what he's doing. They never read it. They couldn't have read it. It didn't make no sense. I know. I wrote it. Seriously, and I'm, I'm joshing a little bit. It's amazing what will come to your mind when you engage this Holy Spirit that lives inside you. The problem with us is we don't engage him. So we're reading our Bible with the Holy Spirit who wrote the thing inside of us and we never engage him. We go to church and we listen to the message. You know why pre preachers are so boring and the message is so boring and I'm so tired? You know why you instantly want to fall asleep when you sit down to hear a message? Because you've never told the Holy Spirit, okay, Holy Spirit, I need your help to learn something from this message. I know Brother Dusty has known him a long time and he ain't got it. But your Holy Spirit's got it and he's preaching God's word, so let, let me listen, let me learn something from the word. If we start engaging God's Holy Spirit in all walks of life, you you and I would be amazed what God could do for us. Right. And before long, you start to say, man, <laughs> you ever been in an argument with somebody and got spiritual? And they went over your head? And as they were expounding on their question, you whisper in your heart, oh, Lord, this is so much more than I know. Please help me. And lo and behold, you open your mouth and you start to spewing words you've never heard before, concepts that's never been there before. That's God's Holy Spirit work. Because when you paused as they were talking to you and you said, oh, please help me, God. 
God said, I got the Holy Spirit in there. Here you go. Use it. I'll plug it right in for you. The truth of the matter is, we could get through our life so much better if we would plug in the Holy Spirit. Tonight, I want to encourage you. Start plugging in. Shift that gear right into the Holy Spirit. And let's get ready to see what God will do. If we'll just take on that challenge. Find something, whatever it is. Bible reading, whatever. Some of you kids, I want you to take time out. When you're going to read your Bible, I want you to say, Holy Spirit, help me. And see how much trouble you stay out of and how much you can glean from God through as a kid. David was a kid. Samuel was a kid. The little slave girl that, that, uh, that helped uh, Naaman and, and helped him get healed was a kid. God uses kids all the time in the Bible. Why doesn't he today? He does if they let him. If we got the Holy Spirit, he'll let you use him. Our Heavenly Father. A few thoughts from your word. And Lord, I, I don't know what's all scattered in my brain. I tried to put it together. But Lord, my plea is that some of your people, maybe young, maybe old, would for once take that gear shift not of their life and plug it into the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit guide us for just a little while. Lord, my plea to you is that if and when they do, I pray that you'll give them clarity. I pray, I pray that you give them a comfort and a peace in their heart and their mind. Give them the, 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 the comfort to know that when they did that, the Holy Spirit actually got involved in what was going on in their life. The Lord may have revolutionized us. I believe his principles have revolutionized many a person. I think if all of us would take time in our busy lives and busy schedule that engage the Holy Spirit what we do. I believe it would revolutionize, revolutionize our lives. I'll speak through this invitation just a few minutes. Maybe some of your people will come to an old-fashioned altar and just for once shift that gear into the Holy Spirit today. Speak through this invitation I have.